past 10 years and also in the last two decades, the number of known mammals has increased to more than 10%. What could be the reason? The reason is the invention of new tools and techniques. We have a lot of tools from molecular bio biology background and so many other streams. We have a lot many advanced tools and techniques with us, us, which help us to discover new species. And as we know, <clears throat> that's good stuff. Yeah, as we know that uh, the, the how plant taxonomy has evolved, uh, the initially we used to simply discover the plants, name it, identify that and classify that. So based on some morphological data and that phase used to call as exploratory or pioneer phase. This is as per uh, a paper by Davis, which was published in 1963. Later on, we moved and we started working on uh, herbarium, uh, herbarium studies, we started preparing floras, monograph writing, and uh, we also developed certain classification systems. And that phase was called consolidation or systemic, systematic phase. We moved further and we started taking data from different, different, different streams like chemical sciences, numerical sciences, or numerical uh, data we used to uh, gather uh, to taxonomy, cytological data, anatomical data. That, that phase used to call as experimental or biosystematic phase. We moved further. Nowadays, what we are doing, we are taking data from all sort of uh, streams. And which is called as a, we follow kind of a holo approach, and uh, which is called a holo taxonomic approach. So taking data from everywhere and trying to classify the plants or animal. So this phase is called holo taxonomic phase. So looking at these two first phases, we name as alpha taxonomy, and later on the second phase is called as alpha taxonomy. So today we'll be talking a little more about uh, omega taxonomy. Okay. So as something new comes, we know that apprehensions also apprehensions also arise. So uh, you you can see so many papers published, and they they have a lot of concerns whether this taxonomy is going to stay or going to go. Uh, you see the first paper called the molecularization of taxonomy. They have a lot of apprehensions, uh, thinking that the with the invention with the advent of molecular taxonomy, the classical taxonomy will go. But it's not like that. So uh, though it is there, it's kind of supporting tool to plant taxonomy, the regular taxonomy. So, but uh, some people there are so much of against including uh, molecular data to taxonomy. So for them, I would suggest to go through a paper by Hortel et al, which was published in 2015, which talks about seven shortfalls in biodiversity studies. You know, uh, in this paper, if you go through, they have suggested seven shortfalls. If you're doing a biodiversity studies, what are the things you should consider? First one is called linear shortfall. It means unless you describe each and every species on earth, there is a shortfall called linear shortfall. Unless you know about the geographical distribution of the species, there is a shortfall called Valesian shortfall. Unless you know about the population of the species, there is a shortfall called Prestonian shortfall. You should know about the evolutionary aspect also. Otherwise, there is a Darwinian shortfall. You should know about the functional traits and ecological functions as well. And that shortfall is called Roncarian shortfall. And then you have to know about abiotic tolerances as well, which is a shortfall called Hutchinsonian shortfall. And there's another shortfall which deals with ecological interaction. We simply name the plant, we try to classify, but we never think about ecological interaction. So if you don't do this, there is a shortfall called Eltonian shortfall. So considering all these shortfalls, I believe if you are including molecular data or molecular taxonomy to your studies, definitely you are going to overcome all, all four directly or, or to all the shortfalls directly or indirectly. What do we do in molecular taxonomy? It is one of the most exciting developments in the past two decades, I would say. And what we do here, we make use of genomic data where those genomes are in plants in plants you will find them in nucleus chloroplast and mitochondria right so uh, those data we are going to make use uh, use and after that we are trying to understand the evolution trying to understand where do they stand how to classify them right and but before a few i think last uh, two decades before there is some stream had uh, come which was named as a morphometry or phenetics what we used to do there, we used to simply measure the length, breadth, and try to understand how they're related to each other, which used to we used to call them as uh, a numerical taxonomy. 
So we just simply measure the characters, the quantitative characters of plants or animals, and then we try to make matrix and try to generate a phenogram. And with the help of that phenogram, we try to understand the similarity between the species morphology. But this had got a major problem. If you see this particular picture, you see the first phenogram, you can see this Opuntia and Euphorbia, which are look-alike species or look-alike groups, which they, are, they have been put together. Same way, Peraschia, which actually belongs to Cactaceae, they have uh, joined with Podium. Podium, which belongs to Euphorbiaceae, Euphorbia, you know, belongs to Euphorbiaceae, and Opuntia belongs to Cactaceae. But if you're doing simply morphological studies, you may end up in a mess putting Opuntia and Euphorbia together and then Peraschia and Codium together. But if you're including DNA data, you might uh, come up with this conclusion. If you see, if you're using molecular tax, uh, data, Opuntia and Peraschia, they are put together and then Euphorbia and Codium together. So that's how molecular data helps you to understand the diversity. The same thing, another problem in morphology-based study, what happens, there's an enigma of convergent, convergent evolution. You know that uh, the presence of wings in bats and birds, they, they both belong to two different groups, but actually because of morphological similarity, we can say that they, they look alike or they are into the same group, but it's not like that, right? Same thing in a plant also, if you see one 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 uh, here, one picture, one plant belongs to Cactaceae, another one is a Euphorbiaceae. But because of morphological similarity, we can think of putting them together. Or sometimes what happens because of the ecological condition, the plant, plant also start developing such features, which actually is very deceptive. We call them homoplasy also. And because of these similar characteristics, we get deceived. If you're, if you're doing morphology-based taxonomy, maybe you are going to put them together. But if you are trying to include DNA, if you're studying DNA data, definitely they will put them apart. Then there is another problem called cryptic species diversity. So what is that cryptic species diversity? You might have noticed there are so many groups of plants where you will find that if you just take one plant in the field, means cryptic species means morphologically they look alike, but at genetic level they are different. So uh, if you come across something where uh, like some of the species are like that, where morphologically they will look very, very similar, you cannot differentiate them. But if you check the molecular data, they are very much different. So such species are called cryptic species. Nowadays, yeah, as uh, we have not lot many molecular data in our hand, molecular tools in our hand, we are able to find out the cryptic diversity within the species. So with the help of morphological data, that is not possible. So as I said, molecular systematics is one of the most exciting developments in the past three decades, where we are going to make use of the plant genomes, genomes uh, either from nucleus or from chloroplast or from mitochondria. And we have several molecular markers available nowadays. Some of the markers are called morphology-based markers, some of the biochemical markers, and we have a lot many molecular markers also. Molecular markers also have been divided in two groups. One is called hybridization-based marker, another one is called PCR-based marker. I've given some example, like RFLP is a hybridization-based marker, and in PCR-based marker, if you see RAPT, AFLP, SSR, ISR, and so many other markers we have available right now. And we have certain site-specific markers. In the nucleus, if you see, it's one of the example in the nuclear region, you can find there's short stretch of uh, DNA called ITS. They are simply spacer region. Uh, uh, if you sequence them, they're very much species specific. They are very much conserved for the species. So ITS region, it's simply 800 around base pairs long, but it will not match with another species. If you're simply sequencing this short region of your plant, this will show the difference. So you need not to sequence the whole genome. You simply have to target this particular site uh, in the genome. You just get this amplified and compare this with the doubtful species. You can find out whether they're same or different. Same uh, in chloroplast also, we have several regions like RBCL, PSBA, PSBD, ATPA. And if, if you're simply, see, uh, they are very much conserved for the species or at family level. So if you're simply, uh, uh, amplifying this particular region, you will, uh, you will come to know whether this plant or the, these plants are same or different. Same in mitochondria also, we have several conserved regions which help you to understand the diversity. 
And as you can see nowadays, there are so many markers, site-specific markers. I would say ITS and TRNLF markers are superheroes nowadays, which actually help you to understand the phylogeny evolution, their age, their character reconstruction, everything you can do with their help. Now I'm going to give you an example of one particular group called Iriokala, on which we have been working uh, for the last six, seven years. These you might have seen it since uh, you all belong to Maharashtra. So in Maharashtra, uh, this is commonly called a uh, Dhankari Gend or something similar. In English, it is called uh, Ariopala in botany. And uh, uh, the, because the Gend is uh, because of this structure of this head, they are so round like a ball. So, and they are also in Tamil Nadu, they call mic hoop, means they look like a microphone. And uh, we have one student, Dr. Ashwini Dr. Shikhar, who finished a PhD with me here. And uh, we thought of working on this particular group because of several reasons. I'm going to uh, explain that. If you see these plants on herbarium sheet, they all look alike. You can see three different herbarium sheets. They all three are the, these all three are three different species, but it's very difficult to identify them uh, either in field without dissection or without proper observation. It's very, very difficult to confirm the identification. And you know, many of them, they are, they are of very much medicinal use. Like one of the species is very much have been found to effective as neuroprotectant. And they also have a lot of therapeutic effects on headache, toothache, nasosinusitis, eye diseases, and so many other. One of the species also being found as anti-cancerous. So if you want to identify them, you have to dissect out the uh, flowers. So first you have to check for the character of involucral bracts. Then you have to dissect out the minute one. If you see the size is 3 mm only, you have to dissect and find out the character of these floral bracts. Then that's also not enough. You have to check for the character of male flowers, then female flowers. That is also not enough to confirm the identity. You have to go for the seeds also. You have to check the seeds. Seeds are very minute, as you can see with the light microscopy also. It's not very uh, e uh, easy to identify them. So you have to do uh, SEM, scanning electron microscopy. And then based on not, not looking at the structure, but they have certain sort of appendages with them. And looking at these appendages, you can confirm their identity because the variation is at this level. And not only this, if you can see these photographs, they're showing different, different kinds of appendages here. So based on those appendages, then you can confirm the identity. And not only this, but within the species, you also get a lot of variations. So you're having the same species, but if you collect it from different, different places, it, it shows variations. But between those two species, variations are very, uh, very less sometimes. So we call this high intraspecific variability. And then also you have limited interspecific differences. Means between the species, differences are very less, but Within the species, you have wide variations. So because of these problems, this particular plant group is called as a taxonomist nightmare. And so when uh, Hooker, when he was writing Flora British India, he has mentioned that they are the most difficult of classification, presenting no good sectional characters. So look, looking at all these uh, problems, we, uh, we undertook this challenge. We collected these Ariokalan species from throughout Western Hearts and also from Northeast India. And uh, more than 550 accessions of more than 60 species we collected from all over India with the support of our institution, Agarkar Research Institute. And we could work out on the DNA data and the phylogeny of this particular plant group, which was published in a reported journal. And if you can go through this paper, we have where we have talked about the phylogeny of the species. And not only this, uh, phylogeny definitely we have done, but based on this, the DNA data told us there are six, seven species like that, which actually does not deserve a species status. They were actually simply minor variations, but DNA data told us that these are not the different species, but they are the same species. So we have merged almost seven species here and some more also uh, we have discussed here in this paper. And also there are species called Ariokala and Rode, which we have reinstated using molecular data. In whatever the taxonomy based, morphology based data, uh, the classification was proposed, this study has shown incongruence, means the, the morphology based classification, classification has to be changed. 
There is another plant group on which we have been working and uh, Satish who has recently got a word of PhD on this plant group called Capparis. Uh, in uh, uh, general, they are called as capers. Uh, we have worked on the cap genus Capparis in India. And here, you know, this particular uh, genus or one species of this genus called Capparis spinosa is being is a major ingredient of the famous Ayurvedic drug called Liv 52. If you have seen this, this medicine is used for liver disorders. So if you uh, if you just go through the content, you will find the major ingredient of this particular medicine is Capparis spinosa. And if you uh, go to Mulshi and other area, you will find these species a lot, Capparis spinosa. And not only this, but they are also pickled. And in Maharashtra, they are very popular as Wagati during some festivals also. Uh, they are eaten and they are more popular in Europe than India uh, because that's almost almost at professional level that they are pickled. So uh, these are the these are uses. So we uh, just thought of uh, putting some two, three different objectives, not only trying to understand the identity using molecular, uh, molecular data, but also to understand the phylogenetic relationship, trying to prove some hypothesis. There is a hypothesis called out of India hypothesis. And also there is a hypothesis proposed by Jacobs, which said the pepper is actually originated in South India using molecular data. So we just kept these objectives in mind. And also we tried, we thought of developing DNA barcodes for some of the rare and endemic species of capparis, and we got success in achieving all the objectives. And so this molecular data not only helped us to delimited those species, to understand whether these are the same species or a different species, then also try to understand the phylogeny, also try to understand the character of the states what kind of characters were present in their ancestors, ancestral species, and then in which continent, where, in which geographical region uh, they, they have got evolved. Everything we have tried to understand using molecular data, which is called ancestral area reconstruction here. So, and also the molecular data, it helps us to delimit the, delimit the species, whether they are same or different. I'm giving you an example of two, two closely allied plants. One is called polygonum porigioloides, another is the polygonum effusus. You know what is the difference between these two? Only the length of this pedicel. This, uh, this uh, the, what do you call, the, the, the flower length, this, the stalk. It is little bit shorter here, and this particular species grows in Iran and this one grows in India. So we thought, okay, uh, we can merge them because the variation, morphological variation is very little. So we sequence them and we just, when we see, saw the sequences, we found certain differences between the ITS region of these two species. So we did not merge them and we just confirmed that they two different belong to two different species. They're not the same. Then we have certain other markers available with us. One of them is called RAPD, called Randomly Amplified Polymorphic DNA. It is again a PCR-based techniques. I'm sure you, some of you are aware of what is this PCR. And what we used to do, we just take some arbitrary primers, we throw into the DNA, uh, the whole genomic DNA. And suppose this is your species one and species two, you want to find out the difference, whether my species is same or different. You know, just throwing those all RAPD markers here and trying to see how many products we have got. So using PCR, you can come to know, you can see in the species sample one, you have two products. But if you are there, they are not same, you will get number of products different. So here you can see in sample two, you have just one product because amplification took place at one place only. Here amplification has taken place at two places. So you have in one species, you have got two products and other species you got single product. It means they are not the same, they are different. There's more, some molecular differences are there. They're very much quick and easy to assay because simply you have to do PCR, check the, do gel electrophoresis and check the, uh, the presence or absence of the bands. But there was certain problems like reproducibility is less. If you repeat the same experiment twice or thrice or 10 times, you may not get the same results. And also it requires a lot of very purified quality of high, high molecular weight DNA. So if you have that very much purified product, in that case only you will find the differences. And uh, also, in terms of loci or alleles, it cannot tell the difference, allele level differences. So that's why uh, this was not very much appreciated and it was taken over by some other, uh, other uh, markers. 
But this was also very much successful in, in case of uh, stylosanthus. You can see this study by uh, Kaisen Chandra in 2019, 2009, where they have found different, four different clades of all the stylosanthus species. So they help this particular marker help you help us to identify these all species using RAPD data. Another one very popular technique nowadays uh, we have available is called AFLP. Amplified Fragment Length Polymorphism. It is again a PCR-based method and it involves use of RFLP as well as PCR techniques. P RFLP is Restricted Fragment Length Polymorphism where we are going to make use of some uh, restriction endonucleases. And it is, a, it is a wonderful technique nowadays if you want to study the population level variations also, they are very much helpful. So this is again uh, what you do here it's a selectively you are going to amplify a subset of restricted fact fragment from a complex mixture of DNA fragments. So you just do digest your DNA, uh, whole genomic DNA, add some uh, adapters, and then do PCR and do electrophoresis. I have shown you this whole process here. You take genomic DNA, just uh, cut them with the help of restriction and do nuclease, ligate adapters, and do add PCR primers. And after that, you do PCR amplification. And based on the presence or absence, you can tell whether how much difference are there between the two species or number of species, whatever you have this targeted. And it has got a lot of advantages, more than much more uh, famous uh, to RAPD and other ISSR and all. It is highly reproducible. Just repeat on, keep on repeating the experiment, you will get the same result. And also, uh, it does not require DNA sequence information. You need not to go for sequencing. And also, a large number of polymorphic loci you can study. But again, as you know, the purity of DNA is very important. So your DNA has to be very high molecular DNA, DNA and uh, pure DNA should be there. And But again, it's a time dominant marker, so you cannot understand the variations at a lean level. And uh, this method, though, have been used in various plant group, but I have shown the example of a uh, 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 study on eucalyptus here. Uh, very nice paper published in American Journal of Botany, where you know this eucalyptus, what we have in India, it's actually represented by more than 750 species throughout the world. And majority of them are found in Australian continent. So the phylogeny of this was very much complicated and it was very poorly understood, but with the help, help of ALP, AFLP, it was very much clarified. Then we all know about the angiosperm phylogeny grouping called APG, right? So you all must be knowing being an MSc student, what is APG? It's angiosperm phylogeny grouping, which was actually first published in 1998. And then it was based on molecular data and there, uh, they have not simply classified the organism or plants based on uh, morphological character, but based also based on molecular characters. They, where they have used data from RPCL, ATPB, and also some nuclear marker, 18SRNA. <laughs> and it has also kept on changing, like from APG1, then APG2 came, then APG3 came, now we have APG4 in hand. So almost we have understood the phylogeny of whole angiosperm, except a few groups. Uh, we call this as an ANA clade, like this ANA I have shown. So this actually contains almost 183 taxa. But what we have understood now, it's almost more than 2,95,000 taxa. What is the phylogeny? We understand it very clearly using molecular data. And then nowadays we have also next generation sequencing in hand. So what we do here, we use whole genome or whole blastome data for phylogeny and barcoding. So with the help of new generation sequencing, it's very much possible nowadays to sequence the whole genome or whole chloroplast genome within a few days. And then uh, with comparatively less, less cost also. This what you can see here, it's a whole chloroplast genome of a plant called Aurelia. And then uh, these chloroplast genome, they help us to understand the inter and intraspecific diversity. They help us to understand phylogenetic relationship, G composition and evolution and plastome characterization. They also help us to do DNA barcoding, positive selection analysis, and also to do predict RNA editing sites. Using these plastome data, they have been much useful. And uh, you can see this paper by Lee et al. The, in RLAC, there were several complexes related to certain uh, plant groups. 
uh, and using this uh, plastome data, they have been resolved. And uh, we keep on accumulating more and more data nowadays. Yeah, here you can see grasses already, we know very much complicated group. And there's a group by Sarela, this paper by Sarela, and they have made use of more than 250 plastomes. They put them together, it's huge data set, and then they, they try to understand the phylogeny. And using this data set, they have resolved phylogeny of this particular group. We have also made use of this data, plastome data to our lab. And using this plastome data, we have also tried to understand the evolution of uh, uh, evolution of po in poils using plastome data from the areopalacy plastome. Since we have been working on areopalacy using this data set, we, we just made effort to understand this areopalacy plastome. And also, as we, as I told you about capparis, uh, using this plastome data of capparis, two capparis species, uh, we had a Chinese collaborator from Zhejiang University. You know, the capparis spinosa are the same leaf 52 group, uh, the species, and one of the variety of the same species grows is Tajikistan in that Southeast Asian region. So this particular plant was collected by our Chinese collaborator and they collected it from the high altitude of Tajikistan, Caparis spinosa variety herbacea. What we have in India here is Caparis spinosa. So we just wanted to compare this plastome data, whole chloroplast genome data. And when we compared them, we came across that there is deletion of some photosynthetic genes called NDHF and NDHG region. And the data set was, it was published, the results were published also. And then it, they, the plastome data not only helped us to understand the gene composition of these two varieties, and then also uh, we tried to understand the, what is the structure of this uh, plastome, and also the loss of these region, uh, some photosynthetic genes, and also pseudogenization of some seven genes we could report here. And as you can see, uh, with the help of this plastome data, they helped us to understand this barcoding also. So now we have this barcodes available. We have proposed certain barcodes for this particular species. So even somebody comes with a small portion of leaves, you can simply identify to which plant it belongs to. So uh, now that is the advantage of having a barcode. So you need not to go for flowering study, the morphological study, simply with the help of small portion of leaf, you can confirm the identification of a plant. We have developed that super barcodes for caparis, several caparis species, which have been published also. So they help us to understand uh, plant groups in a much better way nowadays. There is a recent paper by Lee et al. published in 2021. So after APG4, this has come, which was based on plastomes which was based on whole chloroplast genome studies. And this has provided much, much, much higher resolution to what uh, APG has suggested. And uh, they have, there are certain doubts in APG regarding delaniance, the placement of delaniance, saxi pregnancy, and white tails. They have already been resolved using this data set. With the help of molecular tools, we can also understand the population level variations. So between population, if you can find the variations uh, with using the site-specific markers, normally it is not possible. But nowadays we have several markers available called RADSEC, restriction site associated DNA sequencing, GBS genotyping by sequencing, which help you to understand the population level variations. So there is very nice example paper published by uh, this uh, Hamon et al. Uh, uh, where using GBS, they have tried to understand not only the phylogeny of coffee family, but also the evolution of caffeine content, how much, how this caffeine has evolved in all different plant groups of uh, coffee. So they have reproduced this particular phylogenetic tree of coffee species. You just, they came across this and saying that there are two dead nature plate. One is caffeine free, where you cannot find caffeine due to lack of time. I'm just going a little fast, sorry for that. But you have two different plates. One is caffeine free, another plate which is having all the caffeine, and most of them they belong to Madagascar region. And then how they have evolved, and which continent they have evolved, how the caffeine content has evolved, everything has been explained here. In how, how this caffeine, you can see this red line where you are, you can see there's a highest content of caffeine. You can see as a blue line, this less can which shows actually the content of caffeine. So using molecular data, you know, you see how much uh, we can understand. 
There is also a very uh, wonderful study published in Systematic Biology and uh, where they have tried to understand three different cryptic species of viburnum using molecular data, using rat sick data. And this species, this paper was published in a very good journal. And in this, uh, there was a viburnum nudum complex, like people were confused which is what actually. They all belong to three different regions, but the only difference between these three plants are the cetacean or this uh, margins of these leaves. So where you have more cetacean, at one place you have almost entire. Yeah. So there was a lot of argument against uh, among taxonomy saying that they belong to same or different, but using rad sig data, they could confirm that the three are uh, three different lineages and three different species. So you can go through this paper, there's another technique called genome skipping, skimming, where you just do a shallow sequencing of uh, the whole genome up to 5%. And using these variations, you can confirm uh, uh, whether your species, they are same or different. Nowadays, it's getting very popular because you have a lot of coverage of genome and also at a very low cost, you can do this species, this study. And many of the people, because of this, earlier they used to think the taxonomy is an old-fashioned science, right? So, but you can see it's not an old-fashioned science. Still, people are doing just taking help of other, other modern tools and techniques. And all you can see, this paper was published in Impact Factor 10. This is also Impact Factor 4 plus 1. And so many other things. If you include all such data to your, your studies, definitely taxonomic studies, definitely you'll be able to publish a high impact factor paper. So what is the take home message? The take home message, although the molecular phylogeny is a great improvement compared to earlier system, it is not the definite answer at this, it is a continuously evolving system. We at this molecular tools and techniques still evolving each and every day you find new papers, new tools and techniques coming out. So there's a wonderful line I, I came across written by uh, P.F. Stevens. Our morphological, anatomical, and chemical knowledge of many critical taxa is woefully incomplete. And much basic and unfortunately perhaps unfashionable work must be undertaken to clarify the distribution of morphological, anatomical, and chemical characters. Sometimes what we think, oh, we are simply restricting ourselves to morphological studies of some particular plant group. So we are not doing high fire research. So don't, don't think. It's, it's uh, unfashionable. It's, it's also, you are adding a brick to the whole wall. You are adding, you are contributing a lot to science. So you don't think that this is unfashionable. You should not do this. And uh, nowadays, what we have to do, you have to combine all the things, whatever data is there. Maybe it can be from embryology. It could be from cytology. It could be from anatomy. Combine everything. And then you come with a, a conclusion. And that will help you understand the evolution of angiosperm diversity in a much better way. So this is the last slide. Uh, uh, now uh, this I would conclude with this. Many of the for many of the majority of the texts are the alpha stage. The documentary phase has not been passed. If you are doing some floristic studies for a particular region, if you are doing revisionary study based morphology. So countries like India, Vietnam, Cambodia, where the biodiversity is very rich, still the alpha stage is existing. It has not been passed. So if you're doing it very carefully with a competitive way and properly descriptive taxonomy, definitely you will come up with the fascinating details of evolutionary history. But remember that update is indispensable. You have to think of updating yourself each and every day. So I always tell that molecular taxonomy is not the substitute to classical taxonomy, but it is complementary to it. So whatever recent taxonomic papers you can see, it's not like that only they have included DNA data. If you see side by side, this discuss the morphological data in detail. That's why morphological data is also very much important. So you can ask me, is it the time, time to be as Dr. Ara Rausser has written in a paper, is it, is it the time to be a chemo, cyto, histo, eco, morpho, molecular taxonomy? Taxonomist? Yes, my answer is yes. We have to be like that to compete with the world, to come up with the wonderful conclusions to it with a better, better conclusion. So with this cartoon, I would end where the two frogs are talking, looks on everything. It's what inside you that really matters. A biology teacher told me about that. So with this, I would like to thank all my lab members and then also thanks to uh, the director of ARI and Dr. Prachi Kakade and all the authorities of this college. Thank you so much for inviting. I hope I have finished on time. Thank you so much.
And if you have any question, they're most welcome. You can ask me right now. And if you are hesitant, you can write to me on this email address I've given, rkchaudhary at aripune.org. You can write to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. It was a nice presentation. Uh, wonderful lecture, though. Thank you. Uh, very informative. And uh, I, I request if there are any questions, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions. Or maybe you can put the questions into chat box as well. Yeah, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. More happy if it comes from the students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? And also I've given my email ID in case you are hesitant yeah. asking here, you can drop me an email here on RK Chaudhary at yeah. So I'll be maybe, happy to answer. Yeah, maybe we can expect uh, questions onto your email. Yeah, uh, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keeping the time into consent, uh, I, I would sum up with uh, uh, what Dr. Chaudhary has explained today. Uh, his lecture on Omega Taxonomy vis-a-vis uh, phytodiversity documentation, uh, he covered uh, into his presentation uh, the alarming declining and taxonomic uh, additions uh, which are happening uh, now. And the additions, of course, with the, uh, the new techniques and technologies coming up, molecular, baby cyto or histo, uh, we can differentiate species and that is why we are seeing these kind of uh, new species coming up into it. And rightly said by him, the consolidation is very important. Like we, unless and until we take up or we, uh, as it is said, a prism is a triangle from one side. Unless and until we see all the sides, we can't explain uh, how prism goes. Yes. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, it was a wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, I thank you for uh, giving uh, us a chance to hear you. Uh, I thank the organizers as well, and uh, over to you, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Pai, sir, chairing the session for Dr. Ritesh, sir. And uh, we all are honored to hear this talk because uh, it was really enlightening and uh, definitely uh, Ritesh sir taxonomy is no more an old-fashioned science and we will definitely buckle up and update ourselves as you said it was really great listening to your talk and I'm sure all the students must have benefited and it was really brainstorming people must have got introduced to really uh, new facets of science uh, they will look taxonomy in various angles and I really thank Pai sir for concluding uh, the talk uh, beautifully i thank you both and i'm really honored to uh, honor to hear this session uh, thanks a lot thank you madam thank you so much uh, i now hand over the session to dr pratima kambre uh, she will be uh, she will be the rapporteur for the next uh, talk, Dr. Pratima Kamre. Thank you, Madam. I will take the opportunity to introduce chairman of this session, Dr. Mahesh Bodekar. Um, he is currently working as an assistant University Pune. He is graduated from PG College, Pravar Nagar. He has done his master's and PhD from the Department of Botany, Savitribai Pune, Pune University. He had received the postdoctoral by UC from year 2009 to 2012. He worked as a on threat funded by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, titled the role of vesicular or vestibular microorganisms in fungi in agriculture and action of fungi in fungi for inoculation.
Sorry, we will start again. So uh, he completed many projects such as DST Fast Track, Young Scientist Project, BC. BCUD project, MHRD project, etc. Uh, sir is expert in molecular taxonomy of fungi, genomics, metabolites of fungi, fungal endophytes, mycorrhizal fungi, and micro microbe interaction. He has published 26 research articles. He authored many books uh, such as Fungi from Campus. He has written five book chapters. Dr. Mahesh has uh, delivered several uh, lectures to college students and professors. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, so, first of all, I thankful to organizing secretary, Dr. Prachi Kakade, madam. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. So, in this uh, session, uh, our today's uh, guest speaker is Dr. Monica Kawale. First of all, I will introduce her. She completed her MSc and PhD from Department of Botany, Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University, where we were a colleague and very, she is a very good friend of mine. Recently, she is joined and working in the um, CSR laboratory as a senior scientist in Applied Phycology and Biotechnology Division, CSIR, Central SART and Marine Chemical Research Institute, Bhavnagar, Gujarat. Her research, um, current research activities are seedling production of commercially important seaweed, especially Glaciraria and Cupophysis. She also had interest in development of cultivation method for propagation of monostroma and sargassum as a food, pharmaceuticals and agricultural feedstock. Uh, she also uh, interested in indoor tank cultivation for edible seaweed, monostroma and gyralia. She is expertise in seaweed biology and cultivation, conventional and molecular taxonomy of seaweed. She was awarded as a CSR Ramon Research Fellowship at Philippines in June 22 to August 22. She also awarded as a Biotech Product and Process Development and Commercialization Award in 2020. She is a life member of Indian Science Congress. In his research career, she published two books and 21 research articles in national and international journals. Recently, she had two projects. One is CSR, one, in, one is in the uh, SCRB, which are ongoing project. She completed six major research projects. And one of the important projects, now she is ongoing uh, in uh, her project, which is near about 1.5 crore rupees funded by CSR on identification of potential location across India for seaweed cultivation and polarization technology. So in this national con conference, I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Kavale, she is giving a topic on seaweed farming, the potential livelihood source of coastal population perspective of Maharashtra's course. So I request Dr. Monica to start her talk. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm sharing my presentation.
मैम मोनिका मैम Rachi, two minutes. I am uploading my presentation here. Yes. There is some problem since last two days in the network. Uh, yes. Give me I two will minutes. Have, uh, two minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Or else we can do it from my end. Dr. Prachi, can you upload my presentation, please? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Thank you. It is in full screen mode. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm doing it. Is it visible? Presentation is visible, but it is not in full screen mode. Now it is. Now, now it is yes. full screen. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all of you yes, and yes, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, organizing committee, especially Dr. Prachi and Dr. Saurabh for providing me an opportunity to connect with the students and share my work. Basically, I am a botanist working on the seaweed cultivation aspect, which, are, um, which includes development of seaweed uh, technologies for downstreaming process or specific seaweed cultivation for edible purpose or for desired uh, bioactive compounds. Currently, I'm working on edible seaweed cultivation of um, monostoma. So coming on the topic, uh, uh, the today's topic of my presentation is seaweed farming, the potential livelihood uh, source on coastal population, perspective of Maharashtra coast. Although I wrote Maharashtra, but uh, in major terms, I will talk about the west coast of uh, India. Uh, as you are aware, as you are uh, the students from uh, biological department, you are aware of uh, seaweeds. Seaweeds are the marine microscopic plants growing in uh, intertidal to subtidal regions of marine and estuarine waters. Uh, overall, world, there are 10,300 seaweed species, of which 844 species are reported in India. Yeah. Generally, seaweeds are divided uh, based on their uh, pigments into three groups, that is chlorophyta, that is green algae, pheophyta, that is brown algae, and rhodophyta, that is red algae. Dr. Prachi, can you tell me how to go next slide? Okay, thank uh, you. Ma'am, I'll keep doing it. You can just say next. Okay, thank you. Want. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, we have to understand why the seaweeds are an uh, important uh, source because they exhibit uh, the bioactive compounds, high amount of protein, lipid, carbohydrate, then polyphenols, PUFAs, and that's why uh, they, they have... 
potential uh, as a edible um, edible aspect so the seaweeds can be utilized in two ways either they are utilized as uh, directly for food consumption for various food preparations like um, salads soups and it is used as a spice also or the seaweeds are utilized for uh, the extraction of phycocolloids phycocolloids are nothing but the gums they are present in the uh, cell wall of the seaweeds so they are generally emulsifying binding or um, uh, binding and uh, thickening agent originally used in uh, food industry the cosmetic industry and pharmaceutical industry you can see here there are various products uh, where uh, the seaweeds are used uh, you can see the nail paints and then dairy products then capsules so uh, these seaweed phycocolloids are commercially important and that's why uh, can you uh, next slide please next slide okay so that's why seaweeds next slide thank you uh, that's why the sea back 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 please that's why the seaweeds are economically important and cultivated next slide please ah uh, keep this slide thank you so the seaweeds are cultivated worldwide uh, generally the seaweed uh, production during uh, 2017 was 32 million weight tons which cost around 12 billion usd almost there are among these 10333 species there are only 10 species which are economically uh, important and commercial Uh, ma'am can you see the screen yes okay am yes. i audible now yes 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 yes, yes. 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 i'm so sorry today we have uh, some uh, network issue in our institute so sorry um so country wise uh, china is the largest producer uh, of seaweeds although uh, majority of seaweeds are produced in china from uk ma to porphyra from laminaria uh, indonesia is mostly cultivating kappa ficus and uk ma philippines is also cultivating kappa ficus and uh, uk ma whereas korea and japan mm, they are cultivating edible majority edible food uh, seaweeds that is porphyra and laminaria and sargassum so malaysia zanzibar denmark other countries are cultivating only kappa ficus seaweed so next slide please okay in india we have only uh, cultivating two seaweeds uh, that is uh, kappa ficus for carrageenan and 
glacilaria for agar so generally uh, we saw that there are three types of uh, phycocolloids that is agar agar carrageenan and alginate so red algae like um, glacilaria kappa ficus uh, glacilaria and uh, there's uh, gilidella and gilidium these are the source of agar so in india since last uh, 1960 uh, earlier we were uh, cultivate uh, we were exporting uh, glacilaria species to japan but due to the biodiversity conservation act we stopped that um, exporting now we are cultivating the various uh, glacilaria species so there are uh, species uh, species cultivation there are three types of agar that is food grade agar bacteriological grade agar and pharmaceutical grade agar so the bacteriological grade agar is uh, the costliest agar uh, which cost around uh, 10000 uh, rupees per kg uh, right now so glacilaria edulis glacilaria varicosa these are used as a food grade agar while glacilaria debilis it is uh, used as a pharmaceutical grade agar glacilaria dura this is uh, extracted for uh, bacteriological grade agar so these four glacilaria species are widely cultivated in uh, indian region whereas gilidium and gilidella acerosa these are very slow growing red algae and uh, gilidella acerosa although csncr had developed a cultivation technology but it is not yet commercialized however these two species are slow growing that's why their cultivation uh, technology is not yet developed all over the world so these two species are generally harvested widely from the nature next slide please Uh, you might have heard that during 2015, there is a severe agar crisis in the world and uh, the agar price is uh, hike uh, three times more than the normal um, uh, normal price. This is because generally uh, worldwide, uh, Morocco, Spain, South Korea, Mexico, Japan, these are the total um, supplier of the uh, raw material of gilidella and gilidium. So in the world, as there is no cultivation technology available, this gilidium and gilidella are widely harvested from the nature. And this Morocco is the largest supplier of the uh, raw material of gilidella and gilidia to the world. World. So, uh, Morocco government has banned uh, to some extent to export the raw seaweed material because they want to fulfill their indigenous um, agar need. So, because of that, uh, there was a severe hike or severe crisis for raw material and um, agar production also. Uh, so here in the chart, you can see we have an opportunity as we have Glacilaria dura, as we have um, uh, various other species of Glacilaria, we can cultivate, we have uh, developed a good technology for that. So we have opportunity to cultivate these seaweeds. So during uh, 2015, you can see uh, we have... Um, Ex, uh, extracted 15 metric tons of agar uh, from the 100 metric tons of seaweed. So majority of this cultivation or majority of this agar industries are associated in the Tamil Nadu region. As India has a vast coastline of 7,500 kilometers, including Andaman and Nicobar Lakshadweep islands, but only Tamil Nadu and Gujarat, a part of Gujarat region, have a highest seaweed biodiversity in stocking density as well. So, Gujarat, uh, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, I especially tell Tamil Nadu uh, is the major um, major supplier for the industries uh, for uh, raw material. That's why majority of industries are associated in the Tamil Nadu region. Next slide, please. So 
next seaweed is kappa ficus although this uh, kappa ficus seaweed uh, we brought it csmcr i brought it from uh, japan which was the origin of uh, philippines in 2000 so after um, certain uh, laboratory parameters and uh, laboratory experiments this kappa ficus was outplanted in tamil nadu and uh, gujarat okha region and it is now successfully uh, cultivated in south um, region means in tamil nadu coast so this kappa ficus uh, since 2005 to 2016 the kappa ficus cultivation commercial cultivation is going on in the indian region so uh, you can see in the chart that number of beneficiaries are trained for kappa ficus cultivation production uh, is 181 uh, tons of uh, dry biomass and value of this um, kappa ficus produce is 63.3 lakhs rupees per year so you can see uh, only in india only tamil nadu is the region where seaweed cultivation is happening so why the reason i will tell uh, later so this kappa ficus is a major um, cultivated majorly because of its carrageenan content and its carrageenan is uh, utilized as a binding agent in dairy products especially and in um, food products in ice cream industries and all next slide please another inst inter interesting product uh, come out from uh, kappa ficus is a sap what generally we have to do we have to cultivate kappa ficus and you just need to crush it into the uh, commercial grade mixer then you need to separate the liquid and the residue this liquid is a biostimulant acts as a biostimulant and the residue will acts as a um, as a source for carrageenan you can extract carrageenan from that residue so simultaneously you can get two products uh, from single uh, plant that is first is biostimulant and second is uh, the carrageenan so uh, in india uh, instead of carrageenan we have a high market of uh, for this biostimulant so this biostimulant is tested uh, in india for several crops from rice maize soybean potato sugar cane etc and the research showed that there is a 13 to 37% of increase in the plant yield so this much potential um, uh, seaweed uh, bio sap is marketed in india and this technology is um, commercialized in, uh, and it was uh, procured uh, by tata chemicals ifco and aqua agri so you can see the brand name of ifco that sagarika is the product of csm cri uh, cultivation technology next slide please so uh, the third most um, utilize uh, seaweed uh, is uh, sargassum and uh, terpinolia these are the brown seaweeds and majority alginate is exploited uh, sorry extracted from the uh, sargassum and terpinolia this is again it is from uh, the south region and some part of the gujarat region that is the uh, okha region so overall generally uh, tamil nadu government has given permission for uh, harvesting sargassum or terpinolia from natural stock uh, during new moon day and uh, three days during uh, full moon day so ladies in that area went to the uh, are going to the sea and they just cultivate uh, they just um, cut the sargassum plant from the substratum and they are harvesting so you can see how much uh, tons of sargassum is uh, harvested daily approximately 2500 dry tons of sargassum is harvested yearly from the tamil nadu region and the price for sargassum for a ton of dry biomass is approximately 11000 so for this seaweed culture 
uh, seaweed collection, whether it is Gilidella, Gilidium, uh, Glacilaria, or Sargassum, or Turbinalia, these uh, harvest uh, is the main occupation of the local uh, fishermen along the Tamil Nadu coast. And therefore, uh, the total livelihood is depend upon this seaweed um, harvest. That's why at, at a certain extent, Tamil Nadu government have given a time period to harvest uh, the seaweed uh, from the sea. Next, next slide, please. So, uh, this is the current status of seaweed cultivation in India. At present, Tamil Nadu, where Mars Mandapam is written, it is a, there is our, uh, near Rameshwaram, there is our field station who is actively uh, working in the seaweed cultivation, giving training to coastal uh, fisher population for uh, how to cultivate the seaweeds. Then our headquarter is Bhavnagar and uh, Bhavnagar and Tamil Nadu. These are the two um, areas where ex extensive cultivation is going on. And since last 20 years, um, Kapaphycus is commercially cultivated in the Tamil Nadu region. For Maharashtra, Goa and Karnataka and Kerala, there are uh, experimental trials uh, already completed. Now waiting for the commercial cultivation to happen. So again, Andhra Pradesh also um, experimental cultivation uh, is uh, completed and uh, about to initiate um, the cultivation. However, in Andhra Pradesh, um, entire coastline is not suitable for cultivation. So very small pockets uh, area of the sea coast is, um, sea coasts are uh, conducive for the cultivation. Whereas um, uh, West Bengal, it is not yet covered. West Bengal and Nori side is not yet um, covered for experimental uh, trials. Although Dr. Dina Bandhu Sau uh, have initiated some uh, cultivation um, experiments uh, during 2009, after that, there was no commercial activity has happened in the Orissa region. Although uh, Orissa have an advantage of having the Chilika Lake, the that is the marine source of uh, water, that is Chilika Lake. So there fishermen can cultivate um, seaweeds in the ponds also. So here uh, in India, right now, there are three, uh, three, three industries based on seaweeds, that is aquagri, snap alginate, and marine chemicals. So these companies are um, procuring your raw seaweed biomass. So actually, Tamil Nadu government is um, encouraging people by giving them subsidy, by giving them project, uh, by uh, uh, developing their self-help groups. They are uh, empowering uh, fishermen to uh, do the training and uh, cult they are providing the basic infrastructure to the fishermen to encourage them for commercial cultivation. So since last 20 years, uh, the women of the Tamil Nadu area, they are earned generally 10 to 15,000 rupees per month by only cultivating seaweeds and selling them to the industry. So uh, this is the model developed by the Tamil Nadu government. So in India, there are generally 4 million coastal population, 70 coastal district and 3,030 uh, 3, villages, coastal villages. So although I'm talking all these things about the nine maritime state, 7,500 kilometers of coastal line, but all the coastal line, entire coastal line is not conducive for the seaweed cultivation. Only the Tamil Nadu region is conducive and some part of the Gujarat coast is conducive for the uh, commercial cultivation. Whereas the pre-feasibility trials are very much essential to initiate the cultivation activity in the rest of the um, coast. Next slide, please. 
now uh, i am telling always that tamil nadu is doing cultivation tamil nadu have uh, diversity and all so why tamil nadu why tamil nadu is blessed by sea weeds the reason is that the this 7 170 km of stretch of <coughs> sorry coastal area is the protected region and there is bay of bengal also and one side it is uh, gulf of manar so this gulf of manar is a series of islands which protect the coastline from the stormy and heavy waves so that shallow region that arrow you can see that shallow region where you can easily walk and cultivate the sea weeds so here sri lanka sri lanka area and this tamil nadu area have the conducive highest conducive uh, locations for the commercial activity because the area is shallow and the wave action is very moderate and this coastal region is uh, more or less dry area where the tamil nadu uh, in the tamil nadu ramnathpuram district is there which is a dry area there is there is nothing to grow in the uh, land so that's why people are uh, moving towards seaweed cultivation as the fishermen are going to uh, do the fishing uh, for months whereas their ladies are doing seaweed cultivation along the coast these people are still staying in the coastal region itself so this area specifically in the tamil nadu this 170 km stretch and bay of bengal area the commercial cultivation activity is uh, going on so next slide please now i will tell you the opportunities uh, of cultivation so generally uh, for cup of ficus carrageenan for glacilaria gilidella agar and agarose and sargassum alginic acid you know this but how we are importing so india is importing 2000 metric tons of uh semi refined and refined carrageenan if suppose we have developed our own cultivation activity and uh we are covered all these maritime state under seaweed cultivation then we can first of all fulfill our indigenous need and then we can import global market is of around 5 50000 metric tons so same for glacilaria and same for sargassum although sargassum cultivation technology is not yet developed uh, only china and south korea are doing sargassum cultivation on small scale basis for only food food uh, related uh, things means that sargassum pulvillum uh, is utilized for direct food consumption so these two countries only doing uh, commercial cultivation as the commercial cultivation activity the, uh, as the technology is very tedious time consuming and required specialized skill so for us kappa uh, ficus and glacilaria these two are the uh money making plant um, we can say and if we can cultivate so we have uh, this opportunity to make up uh, the indian need and uh, we can enter into the global market also on the other hand there are several products like protein lipid uh, there are some uh, bioactive compounds like uh, fucoidin uh, or pigments phycocyanin phycoerythrin and some minerals you can extract from the sea weeds also simultaneously next slide please so seaweed cultivation methods in india so i am telling you uh, the two scenarios that one is for tamil nadu and one is for uh, west coast of india so as i earlier said tamil nadu have a shallow area and sheltered area commercial cultivation activities happen so it is uh, 
done in two ways. That is generally a raft method and off-bottom monoline method. A raft method, you can see here, there is a bamboo raft uh, made up of three by three meters. Uh, and there is a small net uh, tied to that bamboo raft. And monolines means uh, some polypropylene ropes, some seaweed fragment, kappa ficus or glacilaria is attached or inserted into the um, polypropylene rope and these polypropylene ropes are tied to the entire raft. Likewise, you can cultivate n number of rafts. Although there is a stocking density problem, so you need to uh, standardize in how much area I can plant, how much number of rafts or monolines. So next is off bottom monoline. Here you need to uh, insert a um, hard bamboo in the bottom of the sea, one side and on another side. And then in between, you need to tie the monoline. You can see here the a man is standing and a water level is up to um, up to four to five feet. So you can see this man can easily walk and do his cultivation activity. It is not like that you just tie and you keep uh, the plant inside the water. No, you need to go every day to the field and you need to clean uh, the plant from epiphytes, from mud, from, and you need to save your plants from, um, from animal attack. So there are some animals who can eat this uh, plant, the fishes, crabs, turtles, they can eat uh, these plants and that's why your productivity uh, can be reduced. So in Tamil Nadu, majority bamboo raft method third and or bottom monoline method are utilized for seaweed cultivation. Whereas in West Coast of India or in Gujarat, we are trying uh, monoline method means float. Uh, monoline method is nothing but a simple polypropylene rope. Uh, to that rope, you need to tie uh, some uh, fragment of uh, seaweed. And they need to do the wave action with the anchor stone. So at the both ends, the your floating monoline is tied with the anchor so that it cannot be displaced from its place so it the, the the anchor the main purpose of anchor is to monaco to the wave this is a general principle of floating monoline and then tubular net method is nothing but a net it is a polypropylene uh, net and it is little bit elastic with the help of pvc pipe you can insert whole 25 meter net into the uh, that pipe and then slowly slowly from one end you need to tie with um, the polypropylene net to avoid uh, the skipping of the plant so from Another open end, you just insert from the PVC pipe and just jerk it so that the whole polypropylene tube will fill with the, uh, the seaweed. So like that in Gujarat, we are trying 25 meter length polypropylene rope monoline or 25 meter length tubular net method. Next slide, please. What is the difference between Tamil Nadu and West Coast? Why Tamil Nadu is so much ahead than rest of the West, uh, West Coast or some part of East Coast? First uh, and foremost is the protected area like Gulf of Manar and Bay of Bengal, 
which gives a very shallow region to walk. So ladies can go and do the cultivation. So why Tamil Nadu is famous for cultivation? Because ladies are involved in the seaweed activity. Ladies become independent. So that's why it become a model of woman empowerment because they can easily walk in this sea. Further, the wave action is the city and really united in the Tamil Nadu region because of this rich diversity and biomass. So, uh, very easy access for people to sell their seaweed biomass <coughs> to the company. Further, the main difference is the culture and lifestyle. If you, uh, if you can compare their lifestyle, coastal people lifestyle and our lifestyle, that is different. So, still there is a very, uh, uh, very cheap, uh, cheap, I, I mean to say, um, not cheap, but um, our life uh, living style is little bit higher than uh, those people because that area is totally dry area there is a very um, there is no plant we can cultivate on the land everywhere there is a sand also there is very less rain so uh, you have no other option uh, to cultivate the seaweeds uh, other than fishing so this is the alternative option uh, for coastal people uh, uh, for fishing. Those who cannot go uh, in uh, uh, deep sea water for fishing, they can cultivate uh, their uh, the seaweed the open sea coast. Also, Gujarat some uh, it is protecting cultivation activity in the core and buffer zone of any uh, island. However, the wave action is moderate to strong and most important here in West Coast you require a boat. Here in Tamil Nadu you can easy go, easily walk and go and walk. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Further, yeah, further uh, here in West Coast, tidal amplitude is more. Almost you can see in Gujarat, there is 400 meters uh, of uh, a tidal amplitude. Means when low tide is there, then 400 meter of area is exposed for three to four hours or five hours. Till that time, your seaweed get stressed because of it exposed to the sun uh, radiation. So that's why it is very difficult to manage the cultivation activity for the requirement of boat, which is non-mechanized. If you get mechanized boat, it will um, tangle with your ropes and your ropes will be destroyed. So you need non-mechanized boat. For non-mechanized boat, you need to uh, row the boat whole the day and after a day, what you will get, very less amount of seaweed. So, Comparatively, in West Coast, you require human labor more than Tamil Nadu. Here, generally, in West Coast, ladies cannot able to uh, run the boat. They can tie, they can seed the monoline, and they can harvest um, from outplanting uh, material, but they cannot uh, go inside the sea. Here is the major drawback of seaweed cultivation, why there is unsuccessful cultivation or why we are struggling for cultivation, commercial cultivation in uh, waste coast because here ladies cannot go inside the water because of their inability to run the boat. Those ladies who can able to run the boat, they can easily do the cultivation. So here in waste coal, there is comparatively less biomass and less seaweed diversity.
diversity. So industries are very less. And here at the lifestyle, here I, I always um, convince my job is to train people for commercial cultivation, to encourage them for commercial cultivation. So whenever I'm going for uh, fisherman uh, to convince them, they are telling uh, what, madam, why you are telling like this, do cultivation, do cultivation. If suppose I go one time in the field and throw my net, I got around 5,000 rupees uh, fish. And for your seaweed, uh, I need to wait for 40 days of their life cycle, means for their harvest. For seven cycle, I can do uh, year round sometimes uh, fishing, but for cultivation, uh, seaweed cultivation, I can go for seven cycles only, that is for 40 days. So I need to wait for 5,000 rupees for 40 days. Here I can get uh, within a day. But when I ask him whether you can get 5,000 rupees every day, that time they keep mum. So there is a chance to uh, insert or convince them for seaweed cultivation so that you can uh, come. It is not an alternative source of fishing in West Coast. It will be the parallel source or additional source of income for the West Coast. If suppose the price, most important problem is price. Here in Tamil Nadu, the price of CBD is very less because less efforts are required. Here, the people are asking minimum 500 rupees per day, which cannot be fulfilled because the company is asking the same rate. So if the company can understand here uh, in West Coast, there is uh, efforts are more, so you need to give more uh, more money so that the fisherman come for commercial cultivation. So if such uh, thinking, uh, mutual understanding will happen between the industries and the the Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, what we need to do uh, to initiate the commercial cultivation activity in Maharashtra as well as the West Coast of India. First of all, we need to do pre-feasibility, means we need to select the site, whether uh, we have to do some sort of cultivation and then we need to, um, if suppose we get the desired growth rate and all, then we can say, okay, this site is uh, suitable table for further cultivation. The uh, trials for the selection of location is important. Second is the selection of area. As we do not have any protected area, we need to search sort of protected area like a bay type of area, like a half moon area, uh, arc area, where from two sides the, the mouth of the sea will come inside the sea, so little bit half half moon area it looks like. So in that area, the wave action is moderate. So you need to select, uh, if suppose you have a hectare area or 10 hectare area and you train uh, the people for 50, 50 people you train for that area, then it is not possible for those 50 people to uh, initiate the commercial cultivation because that area, that much area for 50 people is not available. If the area is available for five people, you need to train for five people. So it is based on the area. Sometimes uh, it happens here in our experience uh, for uh, giving training the area is very less, but we are giving training to several people. So how many people come forward for uh, doing cultivation? So likewise, there should be a small group of people based on the area of that um, village. 
further although i am talking about seaweed cultivation and opportunities the basic problem for cultivation to successful is the require seed material tamil nadu have very uh, less monsoon but in west coast we have a severe monsoon so our cultivation activity can uh, be done from october to april maximum because in may month pre monsoon uh, condition uh, will destroy your farm and in monsoon you cannot cultivate the seaweed because of low salinity because of heavy monsoon and rough atmospheric condition ho sir i it na hello te gelai na re ta ha am i audible nahi nahi man mon utar na mage bete ikde hote na showroom la something uh, look at the mute your mic participants kindly uh, mute your mic and then thank you to get over here they are in the nay okay so you required a seed bank who whoever means some uh, it is not necessary that all people should come in the cultivation activity some people can do business of seed bank how we are giving uh, seeds for agriculture land agriculture um, uh, plants likewise for for kappa ficus and glacilaria because you have restrictions that during monsoon season seaweed life cycle is very uh, very uh, less that is for 5 to 6 months so uh, till you initiate your cultivation activity you should have the sufficient amount of seed material in your hand so in while it is not uh, it it is it may not happen that every time you can get sufficient amount of seed material as if you can uh, say the glacilaria dura who is the bacteriological source of um, agar so it is very restricted uh, seaweed uh, growing in gujarat region only two places uh, that that plant is growing now the plant become endangered because we are every time exploiting that plant so uh, we need to conserve that wild wild plant also so artificially you need to maintain the plant in the indoor tank cultivation facility or uh, indoor land based cultivation facility so during monsoon or during off season you can maintain the plant in the tank as well as earthen ponds next slide please ah uh, one minute so this is uh, the recommended site or non recommended site so uh, the first photograph where you can see the maximum uh, heavy uh, wave action which is not suitable for cultivation the rocky area where waves can dash uh, and drag so that area is not suitable for the cultivation the second uh, photographs where you can see the arc region um, of the shore and uh, it is more uh, the wave action is comparatively moderate than the first photograph so such type of area you need to select uh, for cultivation next slide please so what are do's and don'ts so uh for cultivation for biodiversity and bio conservation um uh, way uh, or prospect uh, these cultivation uh, material whatever floaters or polypropylene ropes or polypropylene threads so you need to take out from the sea after your cultivation you should not throw your net should not throw uh, or should not float in the sea as it is so that it should not affect the other animals sometimes what happen the net is um, uh, the turtle some fishes uh, <coughs> the crabs they are um, trapped in that net so our cultivation should be eco friendly uh, it should not harm to some some other organisms so what are do's uh, don't do the cultivation in the coral area uh, so don't gati kadam na macha muli la olakta ka should follow the weather report whether uh, storms are coming or not so don't do participants can you please uh, mute your mic please 
so uh, you should aware of uh, weather reports weather forecasting and then uh, you should follow the do's and don'ts of cultivation activities the protocol which are given by uh, the scientists next slide please so commercial analysis now here um, uh, the commercial analysis of cube net and monoline so what is the difference between cube net and monoline cube net is nothing but um, a polypropylene um, uh, net uh, which is 25 meter length and monoline is simple uh, polypropylene net with the uh, polypropylene rope without any cover for tube net method the initial seed material for tube net single tube net is 10 kg and monoline here 1.5 kg both the crop cycle are for 40 days i mean for 40 days you have to harvest the plant and again you need to put 10 kg or 1.5 kg as a seed material so among 30 kg uh, 20 kg is your harvest and 10 kg is your seed material so net yield is 20 kg or 8.5 kg <clears throat> you can um, cultivate this 40 days of cycle likewise you can harvest four cycles or five cycles in a year so the market value for glacilaria is different and for kappa ficus is different for kappa ficus it is 5 rupees per kg of fresh weight and for glacilaria it is 10 rupees per kg for fresh weight so based on the species based on the method which you are using uh, the um, costing is uh, there is a variation in the cost. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see the cost of tubular net method and long line net method. What is the investment cost and what is uh, the harvest cost uh, you get? For investment cost, what is there? Uh, you required a cube net, you required a polypropylene rope, anchor stone for one time for a year, then floaters, it may be, uh, if you can keep your floaters very neat and clean, then you can continue for uh, these floaters for five years also. It's depend upon how you maintain your farm. So uh, if you can able to maintain the farm very uh, affordable price, then uh, your earning will be more. Next slide, please. Challenges and opportunities. As environment is the major challenge sometimes um, rainy season is prolonged so that we cannot uh, initiate cultivation activity majority times grazers means these primary um, uh, mean these species some crabs uh, turtles they are eating uh, our plants or productivity become less sometimes other seaweeds are growing on that seaweed sometimes mud deposition is there so repeated um, mechanical uh, maintenance is required if suppose uh, there is some change in environment your plant may attack with some disease so that kappa ficus uh, there is a known disease that that is ice size. It, it is uh, developed when the te temperature is high and humidity is more and wave action is moderate. So during that time, uh, the ice size disease can affect the cup of ficus uh, productivity. Then um, seed availability is the major problem. In West Coast, manpower, transportation, because our coasts are inside uh, in the rural area and the industries will be in the um, uh, urban area so the transportation and manpower uh, these are the uh, little challenges so opportunities that we have a huge uh, indigenous market we development of seed bank or development of seed path, uh, encouraging people for commercial cultivation and all. Uh, so um, these are the opportunities. Uh, so sky is the limit for the opportunity for seaweed cultivation. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, another aspect I would like to tell, uh, we also have uh, some edible seaweeds. So, uh, porphyra, ulva and monostoma, these are the prominent uh, seaweeds which are directly consumed as a food. And uh, here also one has uh, an opportunity to develop a land-based cultivation system for uh, production of food grade algae. Uh, here also like spirulina, you can cultivate uh, these uh, seaweeds. Uh, for uh, larger uh, opportunities. So, because uh, these uh, green seaweeds or generally red seaweeds, these are used in poultry feed or animal feed and fish feed also. So, as these contain high amount of minerals, these can be used. Although we Indians have very uh, choosy for our food, but um, you can um, uh, you can test uh, seaweeds also for human consumption after toxic uh, toxicological uh, studies next slide please okay thank you this is our dream to uh, convert all the maritime states uh, to under cultivation of seaweed so with this uh, goal, I, I will conclude um, my topic. Thank you very much. I hope I, I may not uh, bore you a lot. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, now the session will open for question and answer. Dr. Monica, I have one question. Yes. Uh, this uh, Is there any example that... Uh, Example of facultative sea, uh, seaweed that we can cultivate away from the seashore. Yes, just now I told um, these kappa ficus, glacilaria, uh, these seaweeds are also cultivated in uh, the other ponds as well as in tanks. Uh, then ulva, porphyra, and monostoma, and these are, are the they, seaweeds. Are they continuously require the salty water or you can... Grow yes, them? of course. Seaweeds are growing exclusively in marine and estuarine water. So you required minimum uh, 30 to 35 uh, PPT salinity for estuarine species and more than 35, uh, 35 to... 36, 37 PPT to uh, marine, exclusively marine like kappa ficus and glacilaria species. Is it possible to grow them in a saline agriculture area? Saline without water? Yeah, without water. Without but water, how? No, no, uh, the water will be the fresh water, but the whatever the, so, the soil is there, it is full of uh, full load of the salts, which is uh, not, you can, which is not uh, you, able to cultivate the other crop plants. Yes, uh, you can try, of course, uh, but the other factors that is nutrients, uh, means dissolve nutrients, dissolve oxygens, you need to um, assess all these parameters. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, this, this obviously, it, it is also possible in the constructed wetlands then. Yes, actually, uh, these kappa ficus and glacilaria, uh, you can see there are 10,000 seaweed species, but only 10 species are commercially important. And why it is because these uh, seaweeds are exclusively marine and they can grow flourishly uh, in the open sea or sea area. If you restrict them, then your infrastructure cost will be more. In the open sea, your infrastructure cost is less. So these seaweed cultivation generally encourage in that area where actual open sea or sea water is available. Otherwise, you can uh, do the seaweed culti cultivation offshore for this glacilaria and kappa ficus, but actually you can see the raw material cost is rupees 5 only. So you cannot get um, the buyback, means you, you cannot get the profit when you cultivate in uh, these seaweeds in the um, tank or indoor system. So there are certain other species uh, which like ulva, like monostoma, you can cultivate those in uh, off-land system. And uh, what kind of uh, material is used for cultivation? It is the, uh, the, the vegetative parts or there are some 
seeds are like that. Uh, uh, see, um, so the seaweeds, cup of I guess you in the photo photograph you can see the red seaweed and glassy larvae. It is just a fragment you need to insert at, and uh, the propagation is the vegetative propagation. So the plant uh, vegetative propagation is commercially viable. Not although the plant is uh, reproducing through a sexual and sexual uh, method also but for commercial cultivation only a vegetative uh, method is uh, feasible okay. monica there is one question from chatbox that is where do we approach for training of seaweed cultivation and does government fund for small scale industry Yes, of course, um, NFDB, uh, National Fishery Development Board is there, State Fisheries is there. They are uh, encouraging the, the people to take up the project. You can approach those uh, State Fishery Department. Uh, you can prepare your proposal and uh, you can approach them. They will certainly fund for you. And um, this training of seaweed, um, we have a skill development program in CSI. CSMCRI. It is in Mandapam region. So you can um, check our website regularly. Uh, we are conducting such type of trainings uh, within two to three months of interval. So CSMCRI, www.csmcri.org, you can uh, get all the information related to the training. Yeah, I have one question, Monica. What is the, are these two uh, are uh, methods for civil cultivation that is tube net and monoline. Yes, uh, there are several methods uh, for civil cultivation, <laughs> but for India, we have developed uh, these um, tube net method and monoline method, floating monoline method and floating tube net method exclusively for West Coast, where moderate to strong wave action is there and raft bamboo raft method and off bottom monoline method for um, uh, the south coast where the wave action is very calm is there any question from uh, audience excuse me uh, ma'am hello yeah. ma'am uh, ma'am i just wanted to know that uh, if for research purpose uh, we wanted to uh, get the uh, seaweeds so uh, what is the procedure from Tamil Nadu itself we will get or is there any commercial uh, institution they provide like that? For research purpose, you can uh, always uh, can collect from the nature coast itself. For Kappa Vikers only, uh, we have uh, no natural population. So for Kappa Vikers, you need to go to the uh, Mandapam or uh, Tamil Nadu fishermen who are cultivating the seaweeds. From them, you can take uh, the Kappa Vikers seaweed. Or for other algae, uh, also, also, they are native. Huh? Sargassum, uh, everywhere, every coast has sargassum species. So, each, uh, wherever you go in the coastal area, you will get sargassum. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So because sargassum cultivation is not happening in India, uh, neither rest of the world except China and Korea. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So okay, thank you. Yeah, Hello, ma'am. Uh, yes. Very nice and informative. You make sure you have done. Thank you. Now I would like to know that the many pollutants are uh, merged in the sea. Uh, are they affected on seaweed cultivation? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, seaweeds are the <laughs> affinity towards the heavy metals. You are aware of that. They are absorbing uh, the heavy metals or metals. So you need to select the site where uh, there is no pollution, there is no rocky area. Uh, you have to particular uh, for selection of your site for commercial cultivation. Otherwise, it will enter in your food chain. If you cultivate yeah. uh, the seaweed in the polluted area and that area is polluted with heavy metals and then heavy metal will come to your uh, food chain. So it will be difficult. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. 
स्पेशली the status of commercialization of seaweed in worldwide as well as india what exactly the status of two main seaweed especially glaciaria and uh, gilidella in indian seaweed farming so she also covered how the ta tamil nadu from especially from india is a uh, good for commercial cultivation especially for the environment as well as for women as well as there are few industry which are associated with the civil cultivation in tamil nadu along with that she also covered the what is the status of civil cultivation in maharashtra so what the requirement or what are the useful criteria for the civil cultivation of uh, in maharashtra what are the uh what we can say uh, opportunities and challenges during civil cultivation cultivation of uh, maharashtra and she also talk on what are the new avenues for e edible civil cultivation so with this very informative talk on civil farming the status in india as well as in outside the india especially overall uh, other countries of the uh nations so i am very much thankful to dr monica for his her very excellent informative talk on civil cultivation thank so you dr mahesh organizing committee i will thankful to dr monica thank you very much thank you now it's time to propose vote of Now it's time to propose a vote on the vote of thanks. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. I, Dr. Pratima Prakash Kambe, on behalf of Department of Botany, DP Bhosle College, Koregaon, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to speakers, to speaker Dr. Monica Kavade, Madam, Senior Scientist, CSIR, Central Salt and Marine Chemical Research Institute. भावनगर गुजरात चेयरपर्सन ऑफ टूडेज सेशन डॉक्टर महेश बोडे सर असिस्टंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी सावित्रीबाई फुले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी फॉर चेयरिंग दिस सेशन एंड फॉर हिज एनॉर्मस कॉपरेशन इन दिस इन द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑफ दिस सेशन थैंक यू नाउ वी आर मूविंग टू द थर्ड सेशन ऑफ टूडेज इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस द लिंक्स ऑफ द ओरियन पोस्टर प्रेजेंटेशन आर शेयर्ड ऑन What's the group participant to join accordingly to the link for the group? 